now from the Dojo Magic Curve Submarine, it's Smoke Night Live with your host, Master Sensei. No, Bill, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, Bill. No, Bill. 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 I don't know what to tell you. I can't help that you drafted Tebow and Vinny Testaverde in the first two rounds. That's your own problem. We can't redo the draft. Look, dude. I'm sorry. Bill, I got a show to run. Bill, Cuban Assassin, look, stop talking. I, I got to go, man. I got to go. I got a show to run. Hey, guys, what's up, Dojo? We got a huge show for you tonight. Hey, last night was the big fantasy football draft, and I got a bunch of the fantasy football players here in the studio tonight. Let's get over the fantasy football draft, huh? <laughs> so, odds are who's going to win the season? Not us. Okay. Jack says not him, but uh, so it was a lot of fun. Not only did we have the, uh, not only did we have the fantasy football draft last night, but we also had the Cuban cigar draft last night, which is sort of went like this: uh, we bought a whole bunch of cigars from uh, Frost D on the dojo, and we had them in a big pile. And then we just drafted cigars, just like you would draft a football team. And it was a ton of fun. Got a bunch of really great sticks. It was a, it was a good time. So, okay, guys, tonight on the show, uh, uh, I'm going to introduce the guest in a minute. You guys all know him and love him and love his cigars. But uh, as the show's going on, remember, you can ask questions to our guest simply by posting on the dojo with hashtag AskDojo. So... You can do that now. I know we're all having a good time. Everybody's smoking. It's a three-day weekend. It's Labor Day weekend. So we're all psyched about this big three-day weekend. Now, now, me and Jordan, we leave Sunday for California as we're heading out on a little journey. Uh, next weekend, we're doing the California Mega Herf, which is going to be fun. It's a, uh, a rooftop herf on Friday night and then a yacht cruise on Saturday. So that should be a blast. So uh, starting uh, Sunday, we'll be uh, out of town. And get this, guys. Coming Monday, Dojo people, make sure you are subscribed to our email list because we got a little present for you coming out on Monday. Is that right, Jordan? That's right. If you are if you're a real, like, cigar geek, like, and you really get into cigars, like a lot of guys, they just smoke cigars, you know, just whatever, like, and, and they don't care, right? But there are some guys out there that like to take meticulous notes and stuff. And so uh, Monday we're going to have a really cool gift for you guys. So make sure you're subscribed to the Dojo email list. Uh, and uh, I think you're going to be really pumped about this. I know we're really pumped about this thing that's going to happen. And then finally, uh, start getting your quesadas in line. Because the Quesada Oktoberfest is going to be Wednesday, September 23rd, and that's going to be a virtual herp. So everybody on the dojo that night is going to be smoking uh, Quesada Oktoberfest cigars and drinking beer. It's going to be a blast. We're going to have some prizes, uh, more Quesada prizes, even more than this week that we had, uh, that were provided by uh, Terrence and the guys at Quesada. So we're very thankful for that. So, guys, remember, that's Wednesday, September 23rd. So it's a Wednesday night virtual herf, which goes, you know, a little bit different than we normally do. But, hey, it's going to be a blast. So without further ado, guys, we've got to get right into the show because i, I got to tell you, I've, I'm more excited about this show than I've been in a long time because the guest I have is a, a big hero of mine. I love the smokes that this guy puts out. So we're super excited to have him on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Skip Martin from Romacraft. Skip, welcome to Smoke Night Live. Hey, guys. Hero is a pretty strong word. Hey, there we go. <laughs> there we go. No, man, I'm pumped. Uh, right now I'm smoking the, uh, I'm smoking the uh, Intemperance Revenge, and it's uh, super tasty, a nice, mellow, juicy smoke. But uh, I like pretty much everything you guys got going on. So, Skip, uh, Maybe for some of the people that might not be as familiar with you and your brand, uh, maybe you could give a quick overview of uh, what Romacraft has going on, and uh, then we'll get into some questions. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so Roma st actually stands for Rosales and Martin. Uh, my partner, Mike Rosales, and I own Romacraft Tobacco in the U.S. We, we actually started making 
Cro-Magnon uh, around 2010. So we've been doing it about five years. Okay. Uh, Mike had a brand before that called Adrian's, uh, which is uh, which was a small regional brand in Texas that he made in Costa Rica. So uh, all the cigars for the Roma Craft brand are made at a factory, Nico Sueño. Uh, I am a partner in the, I own half the factory with my partner, uh, Esteban Diesel. And I actually live here in Nicaragua. Um, Roma Craft <clears throat> consists of the Roma Craft brands. We still have some business that comes out of Costa Rica, mainly uh, some bundle things we make for uh, some Indian reservations in, in Oklahoma. But other than that, uh, pretty much the ma majority of our business is uh, the Cro-Magnon brand, which is Cro-Magnon and Cro-Magnon Aquatine, and Temperance, which comes in Connecticut and Brazil, Atapadaca, the, the one you're smoking. Uh, we, ha we have a, uh, a brand called Neanderthal, uh, which just came out in the last year or so. And then every couple of years, we make a, a cigar called Craft, which is a is a usually a different kind of cigar that we make uh, as a limited edition. Um, other than that, here in the factory, we make we also make some uh, smaller brands for for us, mainly for retailers. Uh, Mike uh, and Greg at Cigar Hustler, we make the uh, Palestania for them. Uh, we, we're right now working on a project for uh, some retailers in New York, uh, Mom Cigars, uh, called Fable. And then we also make uh, two brands for a store in Chicago, uh, Blue Havana, called uh, Abaddon and Ouroboros. So, um, you know, we're pretty small. We make here in the factory. This year we'll make less than a million cigars a year. So we're actually a pretty small factory. But about 15,000, 20,000 cigars a week. Now, Skip, that factory has grown a lot. I mean, uh, uh, tell, tell a little bit. I've heard the story, but uh, some guys might not have, about how that sort of uh, came to be. I mean, it was basically in a garage uh, originally, and uh, you guys built some rolling tables, and uh, the next thing you know, you're expanding and growing, and, uh, and here you are today uh, cranking out. You know, it, it might be a smaller amount than – you know some big factories of course but that's you know you got a, a thing going there but it started just humbly in a garage yeah our first order for Esteban for Cro-Magnon when Cro-Magnon was what it was going what it was originally was a private label for my retail operation which was have a cigar um, so I had had a store in Galveston Texas uh, sold uh, private label things that I picked up at other factories and uh, was going to work with Mike on this project for, for my store. I was going to actually rebuild my store in Austin. Um, so our first order to Esteban was about 5,000 cigars. About four or five months in, the orders for Cro-Magnon, because it was so um, such demand for it, kind of in the early days of social media, um, we, we, we were selling you know, something like 20, 25,000 a, a month. So... At that point, we had to uh, build a building uh, in the back of Esteban's house. At this time, Esteban was still running Scandinavia, so the cigars were all being rolled on nights and weekends. And then around 2012, uh, after we formed Nico Sueño, Esteban and I bought this building here and started rebuilding uh, this factory. And uh, we built it with the idea in mind that we would have only 10 pairs of rollers making, you know, 20,000 cigars a month or so, so, or a week. So, uh, now, you know, we, we've kind of reached that number and, and that's kind of where we want to stay. You know, Skip, the cool thing about, uh, Roma craft is that I, that I really appreciate and that I like is sort of the vision and the branding, which is what I want you to talk about next. But I think you're one of the few companies that have have really nailed this whole idea of you know craft cigars, which I think is where the industry's headed, similar to beer and similar to bourbon. You know, craft beer, craft bourbon, that kind of stuff, super popular. And it seems to me, um, from my perspective, being uh, the guy on the dojo, is that you know guys are gravitating towards this you know really high end, and I don't want to call it boutique 
necessarily because that's sort of a an ambiguous word, but the craft part of it, but the, even the branding and the way you do your bands and boxes, you know, you really nailed this sort of idea of, you know, small batch, you know, high end quality stuff. And I'm just <clears throat> curious about, uh, you know, how you came about the way you market the stuff. What was the vision? And uh, talk about you know, the, the branding and the bands and the boxes and, and the vision. And how did you come up with, with this kind of stuff? Well, I mean, when we first came out, I mean, the the name Crow Magnum was just uh, was just something to call the cigar. Uh, you know, before it was Crow Magnum, it was Liga 3-2, right? Or Liga 4-1. So, um, you know, we, we had to call it something. Um, and, and Mike and I liked this idea around the subculture of cigar smokers, kind of the beginning of, of the culture uh, of, you know, kind of like a caveman, but a little more cultured. We actually were going to call the first one. Mike wanted to call the first, the brand, um, Harry Knuckles or something like that, uh, you know. And then, then, then I told him, asked him if he had ever heard of a knuckle dragger, and you know, what's a knuckle dragger? It's kind of like a caveman. So right. then we were we were going to do Neanderthal, but then the cigar actually wasn't as strong as as we thought for that name it needed to be. So we kind of went with the idea of the kind of the early modern human, the more uh, cultured caveman because really you know so many guys sitting around in a cigar lounge or in a garage or wherever it's generally a bunch of guys just kind of sitting around talking not too dissimilar to what you would have seen you know thirty five thousand years ago or whatever but um so the name really wasn't super important to us and and even today i mean you have to call the, the cigar something um retail when we actually started selling to retail stores they came in huge boxes with no labels and then the, the retailers demanded that we put labels on it. So that, that's how we, we went, the, went with the labels that were as simple as possible. Um, but for us, it's always been about the tobacco. So, so I think the, I don't like the term boutique. Boutique really, boutique to me as a definition is something that it, as a, as a, it, it's, a, it's actually a store, a boutique is a store. But in terms of a boutique brand, it's generally more similar to what you would find as a store private label. So if, if, if uh, let's say for example, Steve Parker from Lone Star in Texas comes to me and says, I want you to make a Lone Star tobacco, a Lone Star State Cigar Company cigar, that would be a boutique cigar regardless, you know, usually it would be small numbers because it's one or two stores. But <clears throat> um, in terms of, you know, what is a boutique brand? It's a term that started coming around in the 90s because there were a lot of guys who weren't these big uh, tobacco companies that started coming out with small brands that were run out of single stores. Padron was run out of their own store in Miami. Uh, Fuente was kind of run out of their own store in Miami. And so almost all of these small brands, start, even though they're large now, started out as uh, brands that were meant to be sold privately by their own stores. So that's where the, the word comes from. Um, you know, Mike and I observe a lot about the difference between the difference between what was happening in the cigar business and what was happening in the beer business. I mean, nowadays you see three or four years later, you know, companies like Perdomo and and Drew Estates and other companies kind of jumping on this this uh, this kind of idea of tying cigars to craft beer. Um, you know, in terms of pairing, you know, I always feel like. What kind of beer goes best with a Cro Magnon? A cold beer, you know. What kind of what kind? You know, beer just goes good with cigars. Period. It doesn't. And whiskey goes good with cigars. I, the whole idea of pairing is maybe more sophisticated than we get, but um, I, and it's certainly not up to me to tell you what to pair with any specific blend. But um, but the idea around the way small beer companies or regional beer companies were competing against kind of Anheuser-Busch and those things. So in the beer world, there were, you know, you had these big brands like Budweiser and Miller and these kinds of things. Right. But then you, then you had these small regional brands that were, were really not very good, like Iron City or Lone Star or um, even Coors started out as kind of a small Colorado regional brand. Right. But, but they still were not very good. They were all They were all competing for that same kind of market of, uh, you know, the, the American Pilsner kind of market and, or, you know, basically, you know, 
beer tasted water kind of market. So, you know, there were some guys who, who really got into the idea of how beer is made and really went back to Germany to kind of the, the beer purity laws to the idea of, you know, what are the regional, what are the internationally, what are the kinds of, you know, the box, the, the ales, the, the, uh, you know, the IPA type beers that you're seeing now, the Hefeweizen, these kinds of beers that were, how, how is it that they differed just because of the process? Or the, even though they only had four or five basic ingredients, how, how was it that they differed and made different styles? And so these beer companies started making these very, you know, kind of garage kind of hobbyists started making at a very small level, you know, craft beer. And, and you know, some of these companies have gotten pretty, pretty large, like, uh, you know, you've got uh, companies like uh, maybe Three Floyds is, is not a small operation anymore. I, you know, I've been there or Prairie in Oklahoma is not a small operation. Breckenridge in Colorado. And yeah. And Austin, you've got Jester King. But they stay pretty true to their roots, which is they're, they're, they they work with very, you know, in the core part of the beers, they work with, with core ingredients. And then they, they mess around with it in terms of trying to figure out how to make uh, their own style. Um, but, you know, kind of universally, they all believe that limited distribution is, is generally what's going to keep them. Because you can't do the things that they do on a large level. Right. But, got, but what you had after that is you had companies that basically came in and bought craft beer brands, but made them the same kind of products as the bigger brands. Like, you know, Samuel Adams is, is a pretty mainstream beer. Uh, Fat Tire is a pretty mainstream beer, right? Um, Rolling Rock, you know, these kinds of things. So, you know, just regardless of what size you're at, you can be good or bad. It's, I feel like it's, it's hard to do what we do at a very large scale just because of the limitations. Um, you know, tobacco is a naturally grow, a grow, occurring product. If you go to 20 Manzanas, Manzanas here in, in Esteli or anywhere, or one Manzana, you're going to have a bell curve. Let's say they've done what they're supposed to do. You're going to have a bell curve production. You're going to have 10, 15% that is, is not uh, really suitable to be used in a cigar. And you're going to have 10 or 15% that is just for some reason outstanding in terms of quality, thickness, flavor, whatever it is you're looking for. And then you're going to have kind of in the middle, you know, the, the big, huge chunk uh, on the top of the bell curve. So if you're going to make a million, two million, three million cigars, you can't use the tobacco in the middle. I mean, on the edges, on the top 15%, because it, unless, unless you take 15% from every year for 10 or 15 years, like Guillermo Leon does, and, and just stockpile tobacco, you, it's hard to make a cigar line that's con continuous from that type of quality tobacco. So right. generally, generally what happens is, is when you want make a big brand, it's similar to, you know, the difference between making dinner for seven or eight people in your house and trying to cook lunch on an aircraft carrier. Right. It's not, it, you don't use the same processes. You don't use the same tools. So while it is theoretically possible to make the same kinds of cigars, they make decisions in the blending process around, you know, you can't use certain um, textures. You can't use certain limited uh, kind of quantity percentages of, of quality because if you do, you can't make enough cigars consistently to, to, to sustain the brand. So, you know, the guys, I mean, you know, I, I love these guys, you know, Rick Rodriguez, and, and, and there's, there's guys who know a gazillion times more about tobacco than I do, like Hinky and Eladio Diaz and these guys. And those companies have billions of dollars are hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in tobacco and do these things. But the reality is, is that, you know, we, we can, we can go get pretty similar. We have pretty, pretty much the same sources of tobacco that, that most everyone has, unless it's something that someone grows themselves on their own farm. And even then we can get something that's similar, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we have the advantage of, only because we don't have our own fields. We don't really, we do a little bit of fermentation, but we don't do our own pre-industry. We generally buy tobacco that's already at the end of the process. So, so we look, we're able to look for things that differentiate the, 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 the raw material, uh, which at the, at the end of the day, when you add on all this, the benefits of having process in a smaller scale, 
um, it, it ends up being a, bit, a better product. Now we pay a whole lot more for tobacco than say Padron pays or than general cigar pays because you know we pay on the order of two to three times as much kind of very much same situation that Eric Espinoza and, and Carlos and those guys have uh, over at Lazona or the same kind of limitations that any fact any factory our size has because we don't grow our own tobacco so we pay for all the middlemen gotcha. but where we but where we do benefit is is we able, we're able to operate because we only have to sell so many cigars we're able to operate very efficiently and so where we you know kind of cost us a little more money on the raw material side we don't spend near as we, we you know we've never advertised we don't have any sales people uh, we don't have any bro we don't pay brokers uh, mike and i have travel expenses but you know the the sales and administrative expenses for us are a, a small small percentage compared to what some of these big companies pay right you know um uh oh real quick uh i got a i got a question that just came in on the dojo so i'll just go and throw these out when i get them because uh it's kind of happening live here so this one comes from uh this one comes from uh, tor and uh, he says, Skip, I'm your biggest fan. You always see great pics, posts of amazing looking cigars. Any chance of the Neanderthal genetic deformity or the black Irish as a full production? Um, no, it, it won't ever be a full production. But um, for example, the uh, we've really we've really gotten a lot of feedback that people like uh, these samplers that we make, these catadors. Um, they started out being featuring the sizes in the four four lines where we had so we have a perfect five by fifty perfecto in all lines. So we we decided to make that. And then when we got to the Panatella, we actually decided to make a Panatella, which is not really a commercially viable size, but we decided to make it for one store uh, because they asked for it uh, in the Cro Magnon and in the Aquitaine. So we went ahead and made the made it in the Intemperance as well. And we when we did that, we made the sampler. Um, this year at the trade show, we released a sampler of petite Coronas that had, um, in it, a Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, Aquitaine, which are not in our core line, but it, it is the four by 46 size that is in our intemperance line. So the genetic deformity will be the feature cigar in our next Catador, which is the petite Robustos. So we have a petite Robusto in all four lines. We have the knuckle dragger and the Cro-Magnon Aquitaine which is four by 52. And then we have the uh, four and a half by 52 avarice and virtue and the intemperance. So we're going to put the genetic deformity, which is four and a quarter by 52 uh, in that sampler with uh, the petite robustos. There you and go. The, oh, sorry. The, the black Irish, um, you know, as soon as I posted a picture of that, I got a, I got a call from another cigar maker uh, saying, you know, why did you put uh, Canadella on a, on a Maduro? And, and because he already had a product like that out there. So I, I told him at that point, Hey, it's just something that we do for fun. I mean, when I come to the U S I like to carry, uh, cigars that, uh, that, you know, that we just make here, you know, just messing around. So, uh, that's one of the benefits of owning your own cigar factory. You can make whatever you want to make. Um, so that black Irish, we generally have that around for the B and B cigar festival. Um, the B and B, uh, Cigar Club uh, event in Washington D.C. We usually do two or three boxes of that for for the uh, auction, but nice. that's generally the only time you'll ever see that. Well, there you go, Tor. That's your answer. Hey, uh, so Skip. Uh, speaking of beer, uh, I'm drinking this quad. What is this, Jack? Moss Highway Grave Robber Quad. This is Grave Grave Robber Quad from uh, Lost Highway. Local. Luckily for us. If we live in Colorado, we live in sort of like a, you know, beer haven, and uh, right. there's lots of great choices for us. And uh, this is pairing very nicely uh, with my uh, revenge here. But um, hey, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, before I get to some more uh, audience questions, and I have a bunch of them. I want to talk a little bit about New Orleans because uh, you had a party, and we had a party. And in my opinion, they, these were the two best parties at the IPCPR. Now, I want to talk about your party first. And then, uh, what was really cool about your party was we got these, we got the invites at the show, and it was a balcony party on Bourbon Street. And so, like, all of us guys were all excited, and we, like, you know, get to the hotel where it was, and we, like, 
take the elevator up the stairs and it's in the room, whatever it was. And we get to the room and we, we knock on the door, nobody answers. And we're like, man, is there really a party here or not? We weren't sure. And so we just open the door, we look in and, and all we see is a table filled with cigars and the best bourbon you can drink and some of the best craft beer you can get your hands on. So obviously at that point we just walk right in and start pouring drinks for ourselves. And when we look out on the balcony, there's the party. Everybody's out on the balcony on Bourbon Street, and there's just tons of people. It's totally packed. And it was one of the best times that we had. It was so much fun. We go out there. You're hanging out. What's that? Yeah, you had, there was even Pliny. You had Pliny, bottles of yeah. Pliny there, which was amazing. Um, so we go out. Yeah, we, we have a – Everybody's there, and it was just a great time. But uh, I just wanted to tell you what a good time we had. And, uh, and then, of course, the next day, I think it was the next day we had our party. But, uh, and that was a blast, wasn't it, man? Yeah, it was great. Um, so a couple things. One, the, the, the reason why we decided to do this is because if, if, we tried to if we tried to say, hey, let's do a big event somewhere like Camacho does or like uh, Davidoff does and try to get all of our retailers to come, it's very hard to figure out how to schedule that because everybody has other conflicts. The Davidoff thing is a conflict. Ashton is a conflict. So what we decided to do and combine that with the fact that at the end of the show every day, we're just wiped out and we all, all we want to do is just hang around the room. So what we're going to try to do in Vegas as well is we're going to try to get a whole bunch of rooms in at the Venetian. It's going to be a bunch of rooms with a bunch of terraces, uh, suites. But every night, just have people come to us. Like whenever they have a free night, you're welcome to come to us. Now, of course, some people come every night. So those are the true dedicated uh, weasels that have no other uh, <laughs> have no other invitations, I guess. But um, no. But on the beer, you know, we brought you know we basically brought stuff from our offices, and and we're actually in the process right now of building our new. Uh, I'm still on the in the architect phase, but we've signed our lease, and we're building our new distribution center in Austin. And, you know, we, we've collected so much craft beer. Like when, when Mike and I travel, um, we generally will get, you know, you know, five or $600 worth of craft beer to bring back with us. And, and when Ainge and, and Mike travels everywhere. So when, when Ainge who, who works in the office, uh, probably at least twice or three times a month, we'll go down to Chester King and get whatever their new releases are which generally there's people like Brooks in Dallas or people other places that trade with her. So, um, you know, you combine that, we end up, we, I think we have something like, you know, 8,000 bottles of craft beer I mean, pretty much everything you can imagine. So we brought a little bit of that with us, but in our new distribution facility, we're going to actually have a whole craft beer bar, which, I mean, we have cases of Pliny. So whatever, whatever, uh, Whenever you walk in there, you will find, you know, the golden, uh, whatever, the, the, the unicorn that you've never, you know, seen before. Yeah, the first thing I did was I went straight for the Pliny, and then I poured myself uh, some Booker's, and mm -hmm. uh, that was a great combination. Uh, it was a blast. Hey, uh, so tell us, like, uh, who is the typical, like, uh, you know, Roma craft guy? What kind of guy, what kind of uh, cigar smoker is the uh, Roma Craft fanboy. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I consider myself to be a bit of a fanboy, but uh, what sort of market do you sort of, are you pushing towards? I mean, honestly, the, 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 we really don't try to market. We, what we really try to do is just make good cigars and then engage with people who support us. So um, we don't really go, I mean, you know, you won't see us trolling other people's forums and trying to get them to come to our brand or, or, or trying to add followers to our, I mean, I only add followers to my Instagram when they follow us. You know, I don't go out and try to scoop up people or whatever. It's people that interest me that, that you know, like our pictures or that, you know, make comments that we, and then, and then we don't just respond to them on our social media. We actually, uh, I mean, I, I and Mike, I mean, all of us, we actually follow their, we know when their kids are born or when they're, when their birthday is or when, you know, when, when they lost a job or when they found a job or when they got married. Um, so, you know, for us, it, it's, it's similar to the way you would work in a, in a retail shop where 
you just know your regulars and you try to, to do things to keep them happy. So, um, you know, for us, it, there's a core group of maybe, I don't know, 50 to a hundred guys that are kind of in the weasel team six, right? The, the, the guys that, you know, they're, they're certainly not just Roma craft guys. These are guys who smoke all kinds of cigars. Um, they may go into a cigar shop and pick up 20 cigars, but you know, three or four of them are going to be Roma and, and we're kind of a regular staple in their, in their humidor. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think, I think we make, we make 10, $12 cigars for six to $8. And, and, you know, we, we, we make them and they've been the same people who have been smoking our cigars since the beginning can tell you that they're consistent. You, we don't have, you know, quality problems. If you, you know, there's stuff in our portfolio that's medium body, there's stuff that's really strong and it's all good. So, you know, if, if, if it's, if it's not something that I'm going to pick up and smoke on a regular basis, then we just don't make it. You know, uh, Skip just brought up a great point. And if you are a cigar manufacturer that's watching the show right now, uh, you should really pay attention to what he just said because I personally do a lot of SEO consulting and social media consulting and the key to uh, a good social media program isn't just posting, it's interacting. And so if you can interact with your followers, that's how you truly uh, create a good social media experience. So uh, you are a step ahead there. Hey, uh, well, it has to, it has to be, it has to be, um, genuine too i mean you know that's what always cracked i mean we've never done seo we've never done you know market studies we've never done any kind of you know our our logos are all made by like me on a napkin and somebody who's an artist actually turning it into something else you know there's no it there's no there's nothing it's all genuine and you know if if i make a comment to, on someone's page it's not because i'm trying to be you know trying to to check some box and being social First of all, there's a lot of guys on social media that are not social. So that, that's the, if, if, you're, if you're not the kind of guy who can walk into a room and start this kind of conversation with, you know, five guys at random, you're going to have a tough time on social media just because you're not, that's not who you are. Um, but it, it, def, it has to be genuine, and it definitely comes across when it's not. So, Absolutely. Hey, my, hey, my two cents. Uh, at what point along your journey of doing – uh, this business and the cigars and Roma craft specifically where you sort of realize, Hey, I think I got something here. This, this is good. And it could be something. Was there a point along the path where uh, a cigar may be released that was popular or whatever? What was that point in, in this whole process where you said, Hey man, I think we're really onto something. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was on the path to being retired anyway. So, you know, I just wanted to do something and, um, you know, I don't know how to really do things kind of half ass. So I was going to do it the way I wanted to do it and do it well, um, at least from my perspective. So, you know, obviously when, when we kind of put up on Twitter, Hey, I'm making a cigar with Mike, uh, you know, we're working with a guy in, in SLE just, not even broadcasting it, just telling the people who followed me on Twitter. I think at the time I had, I don't know, 2,500 followers, but they were all like quality followers. They were all guys who followed forums or followed blogs or were cigar smokers, people that I had met. Um, we'd been doing, you know, uh, tweet ups and stuff like that. So, um, when, when, when we went down to blend it and said, Hey, it's, it's November, we're going to release the cigar in January, February. And we sold a thousand five pack samplers in two days before anyone had ever smoked it. Mike's like, that's unreal. That's crazy. Like, how do you, how do you get a thousand people to give you their credit card number, pay for something that's not going to be here for two months? Right. I'm like, well, people trust my, I mean, if I say a cigar is good, they'll trust it. Right. I mean, you know, I, these are people who are my friends. They're not just customers. Right. I mean, they're, they're more than that. Uh, so, um, at that point, we told Esteban, hey, we're going to need some more cigars. We ordered another 10,000 cigars. And then about two weeks later, we said, hey, we're actually going to sell, um, you know, some more sampler packs. And a lot of people were saying, well, can't you just go ahead and sell us, you know, five packs or 10 packs of just the sizes we want? We already ordered the sampler. 
So when we started selling just the five tap packs and 10 packs, we, we sold another, another 25 or 30,000 cigars in a matter of a month before the first cigar had ever come out. That's amazing. So, so, you know, when they actually came out and people actually started purchasing them again, and again, we weren't going through retailers. It was all through us directly. So I knew exactly how many customers we had, how, how often they were reordering. And these were, I mean, these were just five pack Ziploc bags with no labels. Maybe there was a sticker in there or something, you know? So when we got to the point of like the, the second shipment up and we had already sold something like 150, 200,000 cigars. And Mike, Mike said to me, you know, we haven't, I've been working at this on the road in retail shops and haven't sold 200,000 cigars in the entire year. Then at that point we knew that a, Right. we had to do it a different way and that we were working with the right guy and that we could trust our palates and, and, you know, basically what it ended up being, if you sell really good cigars at a fair price and, and engage with the people who are, who are taking care of you and supporting you, then you can build a, a good cigar company. If you just, you know, say, Hey, I'd love to have a cigar brand, come up with some great art, hire a bunch of brokers, hire some no name, you know, guy who you don't know to make cigars in SLE, maybe you'll, maybe you'll do okay. Maybe you won't. But, um, we knew we were onto something at that point. And, and basically we've just, we've operated in that same model ever since we just do it through retailers now instead of directly. That's an incredible story, man. What a, what a <clears throat> jump start you got just right out of the gate. Hey, Dojo, so we're, we're over the halfway mark now. So I got a bunch of questions and I promised you guys I'd get to them. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start throwing some of the uh, community questions to Skip, and uh, and see what he says. This first one uh, comes in from Canada, Skip, and uh, it's from Ozzy19, and he wants to know uh, what is your go-to smoke. So this is a job, <laughs> right? So smoking cigars is part of my job. So I actually have to smoke. Um, a large number. I mean, fortunately, I smoke uh, 10, 12 cigars a day. I don't actually sleep much, so I smoke a lot of cigars. Esteban um, probably smokes five or six cigars a day. So bet between the two of us, we have to smoke uh, selections from the production on a regular basis. Um, so if we, have, if we know we have a change in, uh, in filler components, we smoke things at the table or just pure leaf. Um, when we when we have cigars coming out, like for example, Neanderthals are going to ship uh, in the next month or so. We smoke things that were made, you know, twelve weeks ago, thirteen weeks ago, to make sure that they're progressing towards the sixteen week mark where we start pulling them out. So there's those same kinds of things I smoke, uh, and you know, in the in the things I smoke for blending. But you know. When I, I actually smoke a little bit, I mean, you, if you look on my Instagram, I generally post pictures of the things that I'm smoking kind of just for me. Um, but the cigar I smoke the most out of all of them is a quantity probably is the little uh, out of Padaka, the entry, the 4x46. And, and the 4x46 is a great size for me because it's big enough where it smokes like a, it has the flow of a bigger cigar, um, but, but it's not too long. So, you know, you can get through it in, in, a, in a decent amount of time. So... Um, you know, the 4x46 in the Autopodacas, the Autopodaca blend to me is, is my favorite blend. I, I think it's as a, that blend when that wrapper is as good as anything ever made by anybody with that tobacco. Um, and, and a lot of people who have worked with that tobacco have told me that. Um, and I, I believe that myself and, but th that size in the, uh, in the Connecticut or the Connecticut or that size in the, in the, any of the other blends. I, I also, I, I have a, a box with 500 cigars in it and almost all of them are four by 46. <laughs> okay. Well, there you, there you go, Ozzy. Uh, this one is not a question. Uh, it's just a statement from Brad from Tampa. And he says, uh, I just want to say that I got hooked on the Crow Magnon on the balcony in New Orleans. So, uh, uh, Brad, there is hope for you. You can go to, uh, there's some support groups if you're hooked on that, that you can get out of that. But uh, no, that's an awesome stick too. Uh, here we go. Uh, here's a question. This one comes from Ted1458. Uh, have you ever smoked a femur from beginning to end? 
I, I tried once, <laughs> but but it it didn't it didn't go well. I I ended up getting down to about I ended up getting down to about maybe sixty percent of the way through it, and before I had to just sit it down, it tell was people, it was tell too people, much. Tell people that might not be familiar with that cigar what it is. So you know, people have made really large cigars since you know making the largest hot dog or making the large. I mean, that's a Guinness Book of World Record thing. People do it. Um, uh, George Rico had a, uh, um, a cigar at the trade show one year that you'd had to have a truck to pull it. It was so right. big. I saw that. Mm -hmm. But, but even, you know, my comment on all those always was, it's not real. It's basically like a wire mesh with tobacco. That's, you know, kind of just lapped on there. It's not really made like a real cigar. And, you know, my question was how, how big could you make a cigar using the exact same tobaccos and the exact same processes that you use for other normal sizes. And um, we tried to make it 234 uh, ring gauge and we actually made one and it was, it was really cool. But the problem was I couldn't get molds because, uh, you know, unless I ordered it from China or something, I couldn't get a mold made that was more than 10 inches wide because that was the limitation of the mold makers. So when I looked at 10 inches as a length, as a limitation and in the, in our thickest cigar, which was the mandible, I did some, you know, algebra and decided that 133 and a third was proportionally the, the right ring gauge for that length. So what it was meant to be is it was meant to be like the big bottle of gray goose or the big bottle of wine that you see in the restaurant where, it's it's a it's a piece of it's exact same quality exact same label same bottle same wine, but it's not really meant to be you know consumed. It's really meant to be a state a statement of the. So Drew Estates was giving away tennis shoes, so I figured well everybody that orders from us will give them one of these cigars, and so we only made like 125 of them, um, and then we ended up we've over time we've I've brought every time I come back to to, to SLE for a long time. I would bring two or three of them with me because the wrappers would get cracked from people messing with them. So we would put a new wrapper on them for people. But, uh, you know, it never was meant to be smoked. Theoretic <laughs> theoretically, it could be, but it never was meant to be smoked. See, kids, if you're listening now, algebra can pay off. Just remember, <laughs> when you're taking algebra at school, it's not always a waste of time like you think. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, this one's from Greg Brookfield. And uh, he wants to know, uh, who are some of your cigar mentors? So from, from a retail perspective, um, you know, my retailer in, in, in Austin, um, well, my first retailer was a guy named Chad Chadbourne who, who, who uh, started Emerson's, uh, which is now his son-in-law runs at Scott Regina. Uh, but Chad was my, my kind of sensei in, in cigars when I was just, you know, in a 20, 20 year old Navy guy who, who spent all my extra money on cigars and came to, and came to every event. And I was the guy at every event that would dominate the time of the guy and would ask him every single question under the sun until he got his sales guy or whoever to, to, you know, get me to go away. Um, so, so when I moved from Virginia to Chicago, um, uh, um, Diana Silva's kind of took me under her wing and, and I had learned a little bit and, and, you know, kind of, Learned a little more about retailing just as, you know, hey, this me as a consumer, I spend a lot of money on cigars and this is kind of the way I want my retail shop to work um, as a consumer. Uh, and then when I moved to Texas uh, to work for Dell um, in, in uh, 99, 97, um, 96, 98, um, I started going to Pipe World, which was an old mall store, the family, uh, the Haas family. Uh, coach is the dad and, and, and uh, Kyle, his son and George, his wife. So, um, you know, they were kind of people who I really depended on to kind of understand, you know, the way the business worked behind the retail side. Um, I actually started going to IPCPRs years and years. Maybe I've been to 16 of them. So I started going in as a consumer, <clears throat> you know, even though you're not supposed to. Really, because I bought so many cigars, people 
wanted me to go and give them my opinion and I, you know, didn't want to pass it the chance. So, um, that's on kind of on the consumer retail side. You know, I, I think your retail tobacconist is always going to be your first person who, who develops or cultivates your interest in cigars because either they're just going to be a vendor who's, who's selling you something, which in that point you just kind of end up picking up the phone and calling Mike's or famous or CI or somebody, or you really have an engaged experienced retail tobacconist who starts to understand what you like and teach you other things. And if you can find a tobacconist like that, which is, you know, if they don't, if they aren't like that, they, they really should probably go out of business because, <laughs> because there's, they can't compete on price. They have to add some other value. Right. Right. Um, so outside of that, when I actually started, uh, kind of talking more to manufacturers, um, people like Alan Rubin, uh, Dion, um, who was a retailer who, who started his own brand. Um, um, Paul Palmer from, from Aganorsa, uh, Casa Fernandez. These are people who, when I had a store really kind of taught, started telling me more, a little bit more about the, the, not, not the growing tobacco side, but the actual, how do you get a cigar from Latin America up to a store? And then people like Christian Arola and, and, um, um, a, a guy named Petrus that was uh, uh, the pre-industry guy at, for Placencia that runs uh, the factory that the Rocky Patels are made in, and, and Don Lee. Um, I really learned a lot from them and was able to start teaching my customers. Um, but since I've been in the business, I mean, there's there's dozens. I mean, Jose Blanco is never short on opinions um, uh, and never has always been there to help me if I asked. Uh, um, and then there's tobacco guys that, you know, people like Jacinto and, and Arsenio at Aganorsa or um, pre-industry guys in the Olivas family. Like, uh, uh, you know, there's a long, there's a long, long list. I mean, at the end, you know, the thing is with this business is you never can learn everything. Every, you know, you, you constantly have to be absorbing information. I mean, I've gotten to the point where I could just sit in my factory, be comfortable with the tobaccos we use, the people we buy them from and kind of stop learning. But if I did that four or five years from now, we would be completely dead. Um, what I do and what Mike does, what Esteban does, and Esteban's been doing it for his whole life, is we constantly, you know, hey, here's this new tobacco. What's the, for example, I'm on a tangent, but um, for example, we're driving in from Managua about six months ago, and we see some tobacco, some tobacco fields being um, planted uh, in Dorio, which is south of uh, here, um, almost to, or past Sebaco. So it's very far south of Esteli. And so no, no, none of us had ever seen tobacco, cigar tobacco grown there, um, dark leaf. This, these are fields that British American tobacco used to have when they were growing blonde tobacco for cigarettes back in, you know, 20 years ago. And so we started kind of asking around, you know, who's growing tobacco out here. It turns out it's a guy who used to have a farm in Cadega. They used to own a factory here that sold his farms to Davidoff, uh, which I assume are now being used for Nicaragua, uh, the Nicaraguan tobacco that they have. And then they also make cigars here in his old factory. So he used the money he got from that to buy land down closer to water and, um, and it started to grow tobacco. So this is a tobacco that nobody has ever tried. It's, 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 it's Nicaraguan Criollo, but, but it's grown in a region where no one has ever tried dark tobacco. Um, and it's beautiful. We, we actually got out of the truck, went and looked at it. And, you know, so I'm super stoked about, you know, trying that tobacco and finding out, you know, why is it, how it, how is it different than say other SLE or Jalapa or Condega? And, you know, once you figure that out, it's a piece that maybe you can add to another piece that, you know, it's been missing the, the Neanderthal we've had in mind for a long time. Um, and it wasn't really ever possible to make the cigar that I wanted to make. But one day we were going through uh, GK's uh, bodega over here and, and saw this really hideous looking thick tobacco from Pennsylvania broadly. It was a regrowth leaf. And, and that ended up being something that enabled us to make Neanderthal, which was an idea we had. So, um, you know, you're constantly learning and, and, and to learn, it really generally requires someone on the other side of that to teach. So there's dozens of those people. All right. So, uh, uh, 
as we uh, work our way, we got to pick the winners in our contest that we had this week, which was the arts and craft contest. We had literally hundreds of awesome entries on the dojo, so we're almost to that point, but I still have three questions for you. Okay, we'll try to do them faster. <laughs> That's all right. No, you're doing fine. Um, this one comes from Matthew L., and this is a good question. He wants to know, how do I join Weasel Team 6? I mean, how do you join SEAL Team 6? <laughs> you know, first, first you got to go to Bud School, which is you know, uh, the basic uh, you know Weasel School, which is which is buying cigars and and engaging us and until you get recognized as a weasel, and then at some point you get tapped on the shoulder and you're part of Weasel Team Six. And oh, okay, yeah. So there's no secret to it. You just got to kind of go for it, and you might end up there. Tell people you told me. Uh, personally about this, but tell people the uh, the concept is behind weasel and why that term is something that you use. So Brian Hewitt, who who's an Atlanta guy who worked worked for uh, Stoger Review, I think he still does. I, I'm not sure. Um, he used to always use this term for people who would b basically beg for cigars, but it was kind of like a, a, a more of a a, you know, a guy who has turned, you know, begging for cigars into a, a craft. So it's not like, you know, it's not like, it's not like just a guy who says, Hey, can I have a cigar? It's a guy who somehow always gets free cigars because he's so good at it. And you don't even, you don't even really know you've, you've been got, you know? So, uh, Brian used to use this word all the time. So I copyrighted it and trademarked it and, and made it mine. <laughs> it's not, so, not a pejorative term though. Well, I mean, it can be. It can be a pejorative term. I mean, you can say, dude, that guy's such a, you know, freaking weasel. <laughs> um, but, I mean, like, you know, the guys who constantly write you and say, hey, uh, I, I add an extra 100 words onto my Instagram post and call it a review. And therefore, can you send me some free cigars, you know? <laughs> I mean, that guy's weaseling, but he's just not very good at it. Okay. You know? the, guy, the guy that comes up to you at the trade show and says, you know, Hey man, that that cigar sure looks tasty. I've never tried one of those, and then can compels you to give him one, like like he's using some kind of Jedi mind trick, and he walks he walks away with three or four cigars. That guy's a weasel too, but you got to respect it, right? So, you know, and 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 by and by the way, I'm I'm as much of a weasel as anybody. I, you know, if I see something I want that I've never smoked before, I'm happy to pay for it. But also, there's some situations where you just it's not. You're not gonna pull pull twenty bucks out of your pocket and say, "Hey, can I have that cigar?" So you got to figure out a way to get it. So uh, I, I've I've mastered. I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm like I'm not the dark lord of weasels, uh, but I'm I'm up there with with the you know, in the circle of the Jedi weasels, for so, sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I, I don't know where I fit in there. Maybe I'm sort of like Jar Jar Binks. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, weasel, weasel. <laughs> yeah, weasel, weasel. Um, okay. You know, uh, one thing I'll tell you about a weasels, because because you know sometimes people don't they're not used to the term they get offended. Like why'd you call that guy a weasel? He's he buys your cigars all the time. He's always posting pictures of your cigars. Like you know, there's this guy Jerry, a friend of ours, uh, Jerry Patron in Texas, who's a great guy, and you know he kind of went through a job change where he was unemployed for like a year, <clears throat> and he, and he was on a non he had you know severance pay and you know. But he was on, he had his hashtag called the unemployed uh, cigar shop tour for like, he was like for a year going to different cigar shops. And so, you know, during that time we were, you know, we would always give him cigars whenever we would see him and everybody like, oh dude, he's such a weasel. He is a weasel. All, <laughs> you, all he does, the only reason he ever smokes your cigars is because you always give him free ones. I'm like, well, A, he probably has bought as many as anyone and B, he probably gives other people as many as we give him. So, um, you know, that's another thing about kind of our weasels is that, you know, they're also the people that have kind of spread the word about our, our brand. You know, one of the great things about being a cigar smoker is when you find a great cigar that no one's ever really heard of, you can't wait to give it to them and say, Hey, you know, I know about good cigars, try this. And, and, you know, and then watch the guy go, Hey, that's crazy. Good. How much is that? 10 or 12 bucks? No, it's six bucks. Right. That's the, that's the greatest thing ever, right? So, um, I don't know. It's all part of being in the culture of cigar smoking. So, sure. I dig it. It's funny, man. 
All right, so uh, last two questions, and then we'll uh, I'll let you go after we vote on our winners. Uh, this one's from BB Walter. Uh, we get this type of question every week usually, but uh, it's a tough one for you. But uh, he wants to know what's your favorite non Roma Craft cigar? So you can name a couple if you want. I know most guys don't want to be nailed down to. No, I don't. I I don't mind. In fact, I. You know, everybody, I, I get a comment frequently, like, I, I love that you, you post other people's cigars, but, you know, first and foremost, I'm a good cigar consumer. Hmm. I've gotten to the point where I, I can't really say negative stuff about other people's things because they get all pussy hurt and, and, you know, you get two or three years worth of drama just because you per express your opinion that you didn't like a particular cigar. But, um, you know, I, I smoke, uh, there's a... I, if you can, I mean, look, none of the cigars that are out there today are bad cigars. There's just cigars that fit your palate or not. I mean, and I'm not talking about the bundles and the crap you get from the catalogs, but I mean, yeah, if, it's, if it's in the shop on a retail tobacco and a shelf and it's 6 to $10 or something or more, it's going to be a good cigar. Uh, so, I mean, probably I smoke, used to smoke more of the floors than anything else. I used to smoke more Camacho diplomas than anything else. But now I don't smoke as many of those, and the main reason is because my cigars kind of fulfill that for me. So, you know, if I want something strong and dark and, and, and heavy, I don't really go to a La Flor anymore because I have my own things that, that do that. Um, so generally when I smoke other people's cigars, it's either because it's something new that I wanted to try or because it's something really mild to medium that's very flavorful, that, like – the Davidoff Colorado Claro or, mm -hmm. or um, um, I don't know, the new uh, Drew Estate Shade. I've, I've been smoking a lot of those right. before that, before that, the Willie Herrera. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's because it's because there's nothing in my portfolio that really hits that spot. So that's why I really kind of go for those more when I'm not smoking my own thing. So... Yeah, you know, uh, a couple that fall in that category for me uh, is the, uh, the Crochier 512. I don't know if you've had it, but... Mm -hmm. That's a good cigar. The $6 stick, and it's amazing. And then the other side of the spectrum, a little more expensive, is the uh, Quesada Reserva Privada, which is a killer stick. So those are a couple that I that I uh, gravitate towards. But they I'm, I, I've never smoked that one. Saka was talking about it the other day on Facebook, um, so I need a... You know, if you want to send me a couple of those or give me one next time I see you. Yeah. We'll be in that. Uh, we'll be in that. So maybe we'll see you down there. I'll have to weasel one from you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, last. This is the last. Uh, this is the last viewer question because we're running out of time. But uh, this one, this one we get asked every week pretty much. It's a running. This is a running argument that th there's literally been fist fights in the dojo around this question but um uh, we got to ask it to you and this one comes from frosting fingers he wants to know who would you least like to fight in a street fight among any cigar personality oh man there's guys i would love to punch in the face <laughs> i mean it's a there's a there's a small there's a small list um I, I don't I don't know I mean, people that I wouldn't want to fight because like you know they would because they would kick the shit out of me. Yeah. Is that the idea? Yeah. Um, I mean, like Lazuka probably has like that retard power, you know, like the retard strength, like when he's when he's stupid drunk and, and like I I don't think you could knock him out. So I, I definitely wouldn't want to mess with Lazuka. Um. Uh, I think probably. <laughs> Jessica Padron could probably take me. Oh, wow. That's I think we have not had that answer yet. Yeah, I think Jessica Padron probably is not a – she's probably a dirty fighter, you know. Yeah. But uh, she would get the nails out. Maybe um, – and, and I probably – I just couldn't bring myself to swing at her. So she had me at a disadvantage at the wow. beginning. Um, I don't know. You got like big guys. You got like big guys like Willie Herrera. And yeah, of course. Can tell of course. Omar, he's got to be what seven foot tall. <laughs> yeah, 14. 14. yeah, yeah, but Omar, he's getting fat, so I could probably, <laughs> I could probably, I could probably, I could probably get a good, a good couple of nut shots in on him, and then 
you know, just take advantage of his lumbersome uh, fighting style. Woo! Um, um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't like to fight. There's nobody I would like to fight in a street fight. But there are a few guys that if I saw them while I was drinking and, and, uh, and they did what they normally do, which is just be a basic asshole, I would, love to, I would love to be able to punch him in the face. <laughs> no, I won't make you do that. I won't make just, you. just because you know, look, you know, here's here's my general feeling, especially with Facebook and everything. People were a lot more tolerant and polite when they knew they could get punched in the face. That's a good point. And That's now, point. now that now that there's a lot of you know, you know, uh, you know, there's lawsuits and calling the police and the whole assault charge, which takes away my global entry and. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why I can't hit people in the face, but there are a few that I would yeah. if it was just old school, you know, back yeah, in the day. What happened to the days of the, you know, the the uh, schoolyard brawl? I mean, come on, that was that was how you settled stuff, right? Fist stick us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you know what? Actually, those kind of people, to be honest, I try to think about them as little as possible because you know, there's. There's people that add value to your life, like, you know, they make you laugh or they add, you know, they give you some experience or, and those are, that's what you want to fill your time with. When you fill your time with the other kind of people, then you're just wasting your own time. So you can, you can get more money, you can get more uh, <clears throat> cigars, you can get more rum, you can't get more time. So mm. I, I try not to waste time. That's the thing, the most valuable. Yeah, the, uh, the economy of time. Well said. All right, hey, Jordan, are you ready to post uh, the final eight so Dojo can vote? We are going to do that. So it's you know where it is in Dropbox. Uh, so, okay, so Skip, here's the deal. We had this contest this week, as you know, uh, which was the arts and craft con contest. Basically what we were asking was uh, just post anything artsy or crafty or whatever that, that sort of caught our attention. It could be funny. It could be artistic. And so uh, – we have eight finalists, and we also have some that I'm just going to show you that aren't finalists that, that were, were worthy of a, a mention. So I'm going to show them to you on the screen, and at the end, uh, you can uh, look at them all, all eight of them, and you can pick a winner. I'll pick a winner, and then we'll let the dojo pick a winner. So we have, we have two grand prizes, and the grand prize guys get the box of samplers of Romacraft cigars plus a weasel shirt. And then in the third place, we'll get just the weasel shirt. So, okay. are you ready? I'm ready. I, I, I want to tell you, though, I can tell you who's watching your show because I've got at least I've got five messages from people just in the last two minutes asking why I have never punched them in the face. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, there's still time, Skip. Yeah, these are like other cigar makers, too. So, you guys are popular, I guess. There's still time for you to punch them in the face. And they... <laughs> Maybe you'll punch me in the face. Who knows? Yeah, it'll, be, yeah. <laughs> it'll be good to watch either way. All right. So here we go. We're going to uh, – we'll show you a couple of these runner-ups. These guys we just wanted to mention just because they were good entries. They didn't make our final eight, but uh, they were good entries. This is uh, Razor Pig. Had kind of a cool shot. Mason, Mason Jar. Yeah, and uh, kind of an artistic uh, photo there. So good job, Razor Pig. Thank you very much for that entry. Uh, this one is uh, from Custom X. He, uh, he goes, hey, look, this is a Neanderthal smoking a Neanderthal. That was, that was a cool entry. Uh, Lopez has the uh, he, – he, there he goes. They've got the uh, Bruce Lee shot there. Bruce Lee, yeah. Thank you, Lopez. Uh, Gil H., he uh, borrowed his little girl's crayons and came up with <laughs> arts and craft, which is really cool. Thank you, Gil. Uh, this is Brad from Tampa. Now, this could have been in the finals, Skip. Because uh, he made this cool Mr. Bill uh, sculpture, but he's won so much lately that we didn't let him be in the finals. <laughs> but good job, oh, Brad. Yeah, that's an awesome entry. He actually plus, made. Plus, plus I, I bet you he took someone else's cigar and put a Roma fake book, Roma label on it. No, you know what? Look at that. He, I, he I don't think that's one of my labels. He made that out of clay. <laughs> oh, okay, I got you. That's <laughs> that's pretty doggone creative. So that is pretty good. That's pretty good, good. Brad. Uh, this is uh, Chris F., one, another one of our uh, guys that makes awesome entries every week. So uh, he's got the uh, sort of a Neanderthal guy doing a cave painting there, which is very cool. 
All right, so here we go. <clears throat> and uh, thanks to everybody, by the way, that entered, even if you aren't in these finalists, because uh, we had a ton of entries, and it was a short contest, two days, because we just finished the Quesada contest on Wednesday night. So we've been really busy with contests this week. By the way, Quesada winners, we sent out your stuff today, so you'll be getting that in the mail soon. Here we go, the top eight. <clears throat> Drum roll. Hey, all right. Thanks, Jack. All right, number one, this is from Camp Par. So uh, take a good look at these, because one of these you're going to pick, Skip. But uh, So this is Arts and Crafts. So he's got a bunch of guys named Art. So he's got Art Gar Garfunkel and Art Monk, and, uh, and he's got you know Bob Craft at the bottom. So Art and Craft, that was very, very clever. It's funny. Camp Par, very good entry. This is Charles G. He says, uh, here he is. He's, he's trying to knit a uh, weasel T-shirt, which is really funny. <laughs> I did plug that one, so good job, Charles. That's number two. Number three, this was just a really cool pick, so we picked it just based on the photography alone. Uh, very. I, awesome. I, I know that guy. That's Daniel Castro. That's our photographer. Oh, there we go. That's not fair. Man. He's out. <laughs> All right, this guy, uh, he decided to get crafty tonight with some of his uh, Romacraft bands, and so he literally made his own sticker out of bands, which is really cool. Yeah, that guy won. That actual picture won the Weasel Weasel Week uh, oh, thing. Oh, he's out. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Those two, those last two are out. That was a good one, yeah. Uh, this one's uh, Jose T. I thought this was a pretty cool, sort of like a pop art kind of kind of entry there. Good job, Jose T. Uh, Premium Smokes. This one was just a really cool, really cool uh, photography. I thought so. I like. I dug that one. Uh, this guy, Scott S., and I had to verify that he actually drew this. And this is his own art that he made. So that's really cool. My entry for the contest there. So very cool, Scott S. Thank you for that entry. That's awesome. Uh, I'd like that to have a t-shirt of that right there. I think I know that guy. Um, I and think I know that guy. Donald yeah. S. with the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> With the one of the cl most classic entries of all time, just ab I, I swear I've, I've laughed all week long about this entry. So, <laughs> That's uh, hilarious. I used to watch that show. So, so there they are, all eight. So I'm going to give you uh, a few moments here to digest these entries. I'll let you pick first, then I'll pick one, and then jo Jordan's going to post this image on the dojo, and we'll let the dojo guys vote on the third winner and we'll announce the third winner uh later tonight as we're drinking beer and partying on the dojo yeah we'll give you guys yeah. we'll like a half hour and then we'll announce that final winner which we'll get a, a just a t-shirt but me and you will pick the ones that get the cigars and the t-shirt so you just tell me if you've come up with any that you think should be the winner well my three favorites are jose t Very scott at Scott S. and then obviously Donald S. is my favorite. Those uh, are absolutely amazing. Uh, so when you uh, when you decide on the, the number one guy, you you just let me know and uh, and that's yeah, D Donald is my favorite. You got to go with that one, right? Yay! Donald S. with the winner, and uh, you, that could uh, that could go down in dojo history as. One of the funniest entries of all time. Um, so I think I, I think I would call that one Puffy Little Clouds of Smoke. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with something totally different, just based on its pure uh, creativity, and I'm gonna go with uh, Camp Par One for his arts and craft entry. <laughs> That'll be uh, my pick, and. Uh, so thanks to everybody who entered. And uh, by the way, Dojo, you guys go ahead and start voting uh, on the uh, third place winner. Uh, before we uh, sign off with Skip, and I want to thank Skip so much for his valuable time tonight. That was it was a great show. We had a good time. But uh, real hey, quick, hey, can I can I ask you guys can I ask you guys to do something for me? Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. So if you go to Instagram and look at the the hashtag for weasel week comment or like the come the picture from the last 24 hours that um that you like the most 
so I, it helped me pick who's going to win for Friday. So yeah. we've already picked we've already picked the winners for the first four days. So anybody that's posted a picture that's date stamped in the last uh, twenty four hours uh, at midnight, um, like or comment to help me decide which one is the most popular. So if there's if there's a hundred guys listening or a thousand guys listening, and they go and look at that hashtag, it shouldn't take a second to look at the last twenty five or thirty pictures on that hashtag. Say that hashtag one more time. It's Weasel Week. Okay. So yeah. you guys got that dojo? Go to go to Instagram. Search Weasel Week hashtag and uh, and vote on that. Uh, real quick, uh, the new stickers came in, guys. The new dojo stickers. So we've got uh, this cool sticker. Uh, you can get the new sticker pack. What is it, Jordan? For five dollars or something, and you get you get some of these uh, for your humidor. And then there's some outdoor vinyl, outdoor vinyl stickers, also. And then you you also get some of our older retro stickers as well so go to the cigardojo.com if you want to order some stickers we just introduced that pack a couple days ago and we've already sold a bunch so thank you guys for ordering that i want to thank uh skip so much for being on the show this was awesome the, the prizes this week was a blast we had such a good time skip thank you so much for being on smoke light smoke night live brother you're welcome am i the first guy to do it from nicaragua no, we've had uh, we've had uh, uh, Eric Espinoza on. Okay. Okay. Nicaragua. We had uh, Santana on from Costa Rica. We had mm. Dean uh, from Dominican Republic, and we also had uh, the uh, Felix Asseline. He was on from Nicaragua as well. But it's okay. really cool when we have a guy <laughs> like like you. Yeah, you you actually have the best connection that we've ever had from somebody on a. <laughs> Uh, broadcasting from Nicaragua, so good job, and uh, thank you again for, for a great show. Yeah, man, thanks, guys. Okay, guys, so that's it. Let's have some fun tonight on the dojo. We're just getting started. We got a whole bag of uh, Roma Craft that Jack bought at Cigars on Six. So if you're looking for uh, Roma Craft stuff in Colorado, you can get uh, pretty much everything you want at Cigars on Six. They're not a sponsor of ours in any way, shape, or form, uh, and neither is Roma Craft, but. Uh, they are uh, awesome sticks. Uh, I just got done with my Intemperance Revenge, which was absolutely amazing. So uh, go snag yourself some Roma Craft, and uh, let's have some fun tonight on Dojo. And remember, guys, never no. smoke alone. Oh. All right, Skip. We'll see you later, brother. Thanks, guys. All right.